My subject tonight will be what the Bible says about the COVID-19 crisis. I know a lot of times when people go through troubles and trials individually, and especially when you have something as large scale nationally and internationally as this crisis, people become curious as to what God may say or what the Bible may say about such events. They know or they have heard that the Bible is a book of prophecy, and they might even be ignorant of the Bible, but they may know from another Christian that they've talked with or a loved one that's a believer that Scripture does prophesy about things that are to come to pass in this life, so they become curious about this. So I want to preach some about this tonight from Matthew chapter number 24. We'll begin in verse number 1. Matthew chapter 24 and verse number 1. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Verse 4, Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in divers places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. The Bible is a prophetic book. As a matter of fact, one entire book in the New Testament, the book of Revelation, is completely devoted to the subject of prophecy. Isaiah 46, verse number 10, God says this, Declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. God says about himself, I declare the end from the beginning. Proof positive that God is God is the fact that he can tell what's going to happen before it happens. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So God is outside of time. The Bible says God inhabits eternity. So he, he carved out this area that we know as time space, and here we are operating within this, and God is on the outside of that, and he can tell the end from the beginning. God is omniscient. That means he knows everything from the word omni, which refers to all, and then niscience or science, the word for knowledge. God is omniscient. He knows everything. And the Bible is a prophetic book, and that proves and gives you reasonable proof as a logical individual to say, you know, I'm going to listen to the claims of the Bible because of these prophecies. There were over 300 Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah and his first coming as fulfilled by the life of Christ. Some have separated these into 61 different categories. But if we were to take just eight of these prophecies about Christ's first coming, which we know he came and these prophecies came to pass, just eight of these prophecies, the odds of a person fulfilling all eight of these prophecies would be one in ten to the seventeenth power. And that is one out of ten, but you put the ten and then you put seventeen little zeros after it. You can't even fathom that number. Somebody calculated that number in terms we might be able to understand. If you took the state of Texas and you spread silver dollars two feet across the whole area of the state, you just marked one of those silver dollars and buried it. You take a person, you blindfold him, and you send him out there to pick that one dollar out of the whole state two feet deep. That would be the odds and the chances of just eight of these prophecies about Christ coming true. That shows you the prophetic nature of the Bible and the prophetic nature of the life of Christ in his first coming, not to mention his second coming, which have more prophecies behind it than the first coming. In the Old Testament, we have 1,845 references 
to the second coming of Christ and a, and a total of 17 books that give it prominence. When you read a lot of the minor prophets, starting from Daniel all the way to Malachi, you will find a lot of references. Of course, it's the prophets. And then the major prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. You will find a lot of references to the day of the Lord, the return of Jesus Christ as King. In the New Testament, out of 260 chapters, there are 318 references to the second coming. That average is one out of every 30 verses. 23 of, 20, 23 of 27 New Testament books make reference to the second coming. Now look here in this passage, Matthew chapter 24, look in verse 7. The text says this, Nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. Boy, we've seen that. When you study the world wars, and the things that have raged across our land, no doubt we have seen some of this. And then notice also, there shall be famines. You can study that out. There's been a lot of famines. And then he says pestilences, and earthquakes in divers places. The word pestilences can certainly refer to disease and pandemics, diseases that have spread from one person to another in the form of a virus, and they go from country to country and from continent to continent. Now, I want to address this subject. Does the Bible refer to, in prophecy, this COVID-19 coronavirus that we are experiencing? Now, there's some problems, first of all. The first problem I think we have is our insight. We are so stuck on reality as we see it. We are creatures of reaction, not reason. And I've talked to several people and they'll say this, and I've said this as well because I haven't seen it either. They will say, you know, in my lifetime, I have never seen anything like this. I've never seen the country put on brakes like it's put on brakes. I've never seen everything shut down and people stay at home. And I've never seen all these um, ordinances put in place, all these suggestions for social distancing put in place. I've never seen anything like it. And that is a true statement. In our lifetime, most of us have never seen anything close to this. But what is that really supposed to mean? I mean, I tell you what it means. It means as we see it, we're judging everything just based on our five senses. And that's a natural reaction. So we have our insight. Just as a natural man observing things, we say, huh, I've never seen this before. Never went to the grocery store and can't find any bread or can't find any ground beef or whatever. I've never seen this before. And so then we begin to catalog the things that we are experiencing. That's a normal, natural response. But there's another problem that we have because when you just judge things by your response, you could be discounting a lot of other responses that are taking place all over the world just living in your little bubble. And so you want to be real careful about just looking at things the way you see it. And then we have not just our insight as a problem, but we have our ignorance as a problem. Some people are proud of their ignorance. That's not something you should be proud of. Paul said, if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. In other words, someone that's ignorant and they're proud of it, they're not going to listen to reason. You can give them facts, but they don't care about facts because they're consumed with their own personal feelings. You know, the Bible says, he that trusteth in his own heart is a fool. You better be real careful living your life based on just how you see it and how you feel about it. Your opinion really is very little in the whole scope of things. But we are Americans. We are free-spirited. We think the world revolves around us. We are so lifted up in our rotten, stinking pride, we often forget Jeremiah 17, 9. And if you don't know that verse that I just gave you, maybe you are consumed with pride. Go look it up. I'll wait for a second. All right, I'm sure you've looked it up. No, I'll give you the verse because you're probably just sitting around eating Doritos watching me preach. So here's the verse, Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Your heart will deceive you above all things. So you better be real careful when you just trust your natural experiences and you trust how you see it. And then you have the problem of our own ignorance. What do you really know? 
If you live in a bubble, if you live in a small experience, if you just go by on what you've experienced and you haven't tried to learn from other people's mistakes, that's really a wise person. Not just someone who learns from their own mistakes, which you should, but learning from somebody else's mistake, that's a wise person. What do you really know? I'll give you some things regarding history. A pandemic, of course, is an epidemic of disease that spreads across large regions, multiple continents or worldwide. And there have been many pandemics in the history of man. I'll just go back a few years. A.D. 165, the Antonine Plague, or it's called the Plague of Galen. It affected Asia Minor, Egypt, Greece, and Italy. It may have been smallpox or measles. They're not quite sure what the virus was. It was brought back to Rome by soldiers after battle. They say it killed an estimated five million people. That's 165 AD. Then we have the plague of Justinian. This is caused by the same bacteria that caused the Black Plague and it started in Constantinople in 541. And of course it's just like in the Black Plague. You have fleas that get on rats and the rats and rodents spread across Europe, Asia, North Africa and Arabia. It killed between 30 and 50 million people. That's half the world's population at the time. 541. By the way, you can look these things up. This is not something that I'm only privy to, and I'm not giving you all of them, just some of the, the larger ones. Of course, we have the Black Death, which everybody is familiar with, called the Bubonic Plague, 1346 to 1353. Of course, that's a long expanse of time there. It killed an estimated 75 to 200 million people. And more than 20 million people, they estimate, were killed in the first five years of its commencement, 1347 to 52. This is where we get the term quarantine from because they had the sailors. They'd put them on the ships. They'd say, we want you to stay there for 30 days. Then they'd say, no, we want you to stay there for, for 10 more days. That word quarter uh, for 40. And so that's where you get the word quarantine from. And it continued, and the plague of the Black Death with that parasite still continues. And you have an outbreak for the next uh, 300 years, 40 major outbreaks. And you have the Great Plague of 1665. It killed 100,000 Londoners in just seven months. Can you imagine? Seven months, 100,000 people dying of sickness. Then we had the Great Plague. Well, I gave you that one of 1665. Then we have smallpox. This is in the 15th century. It affected Europe, Asia, and Arabia. It killed three out of ten people that infected. When it arrived in the New World, when the Spanish came over and it arrived over here down in Mexico, Mexico went from 11 million people to 1 million people. In other words, it killed 90 to 95 percent of the indigenous population in a century. That is unreal when you think about the numbers. That's the smallpox. In 1801, a man invented a vaccine for the smallpox, and by 1980, they declared that finally the world was eradicated of the smallpox virus. Then we have cholera. Cholera is a bad disease and pandemic. There are several major cholera pandemics. The third cholera pandemic, 1852 to 1860, killed one million people. It originated in India. There's a flu pandemic, 1889 to 1890. It's called the Asiatic flu or the Russian flu. And they're simply giving these names because of origination, where it started. It killed one million people. The sixth cholera pandemic, 1910 to 1911, it originated in India. It killed over 800,000 before it spread to the Middle East, North Africa, Eastern Europe, and Russia, and the USA. But the USA put uh, implementation into effect, and you only had 11 deaths in the United States from the sixth cholera pandemic. Some of these numbers can vary depending on the sources that you look up. 1918 to 1919, of course, this is the famous Spanish flu. At least 50 million deaths, conservatively. Some go much higher. 675,000 deaths in the United States of America. It was the H1N1 virus. You have 10 to 20% mortality rates. 
25 million deaths in the first 25 weeks alone. The thing about that, and you can watch documentaries on this, the thing about the Spanish flu is it killed young, healthy adults. The older people did not get affected by it as much as your you know, 20 to 45 age. Young, healthy adult people died from this. 1956 to 58, you had what they called the Asian flu. It originated in China. It killed 2 million worldwide. It was the H2N2 virus, 69,000. And then I looked up another report, said 110,000. In the United States, 110,000, 1956 to 1958, the Asian flu. That's not to be confused with the Hong Kong flu, 1968. And, of course, the Hong Kong flu was named that because of its origination in Hong Kong. It killed 500,000 residents in Hong Kong, 15% of its population. It was the H3N2 strain of influenza, and more than a million people worldwide died. It killed 100,000 people in the United States. That's 1968. Then when you look at pandemics, as far as viruses being spread, you have HIV, AIDS, of course, a lot of that being passed by way of uh, generation and by way of kids being born in countries with it. You have between 2005 and 2012, 36 million deaths uh, since uh, 1981, I think, is my data on that. H1N1 is the most recent for us. 2009 in the United States, we had, two, we had 13,000 deaths. That's 2009. The H1N1 virus killed 13,000 in the United States. So, as your mind begins to soak all these facts and figures in, can you imagine being a Christian back during the bubonic plague in 1346 to 53? And you could read accounts of what some of the people did. Of course, you're dealing with the Dark Ages, and there was not much biblical truth for Christians. So, the people that were believers were caught up in these bad Roman Catholic systems and they would take people out. They even took Jews for a couple of years and they persecuted the Jews because they thought the Jews had brought this plague on. They had no sense of knowledge as far as science is concerned and biology to understand things with disease. And it was horrific, some of the tortures that they put people through because of their religious convictions. Obviously, they began to believe things based on superstition or based on hearsay or based on just what someone said. But when you have things like this, no doubt your mind begins to wonder and you begin to look for answers, which is a good thing if you're looking in the right places. And so we want to look in the scriptures. And here's another problem is we have a, not only ignorance of history, but we have an ignorance of the Bible. Now, I gave you the verse there, Matthew chapter 24, verse number 7, and some of you are still waiting to see if I am going to apply the coronavirus, the COVID-19 virus, to verse number 7, pestilences, because some of you are not quite sure if we should make that application or not. You've heard many preachers preach Matthew 24 and some of the other passages in the New Testament where it speaks of the earthquakes and of the uh, uh, nations joining with nations and even some of the prophecies in the book of Revelation. The Bible speaks about a grievous sore that comes on people. And the Bible speaks about the great earthquake in the book of Revelation. It speaks about the stars falling from the heavens. And we have this prophecy to go along with that. And so you're wondering if I'm going to be like a lot of the preachers and say, you know, here we have another sign of the time. We know Jesus is coming back right around the corner because of this COVID-19 virus. I am not about to preach that. And I'm going to tell you why in just a minute. But before I do, let me say this about disease, sickness, and pestilences biblically. We'll talk, we talked about the problems. Now let's talk about the playwright. Who's behind this? Now if you'll take your Bible and turn over to Luke chapter 13, I want you to see something here. Get Luke chapter 13 and then we'll come to the book of Job. Luke chapter number 13. Luke chapter 13, come down if you will. This is a passage where Christ heals someone. Come down to Luke chapter number 13 to verse number 10. Luke 13, 10. And as he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bowed together and could in no wise lift 
up herself. She's bent over. She's got this back problem, this infirmity. Verse 12, And when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said unto her, Woman, thou art loose from thine infirmity. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. Verse 14, And the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation, because that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day, and said unto the people, There are six days in which men ought to work in them, therefore come and be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. Then the Lord then answered him and said, Verse 15, Thou hypocrite, doth not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or his ass from the stall and lead him away to watering? And ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound, lo, these eighteen years be loose from this bond on the Sabbath day? Notice in verse 16 what he says, Whom Satan hath bound. Come over to Job chapter number 2. Job chapter number 2. So what are you saying, preacher? I'm telling you, disease can come from the devil. Job chapter 2. Job chapter number 2. Now in this passage in Job, we have, Job has such depth to it because Job helps us to see the playwright. It helps us to see who or what is behind the thing that's in front of us. So what we have in Job chapters 1 and 2 is the behind the scenes story of why all of this tragedy is happening in Job's life. His kids die. He loses all of his money. He loses all of his wealth. He loses all of his fame as far as a leader. He loses his family. His kids die. And then he loses his health. But there's something that goes on behind the scenes before all that takes place. We have a conversation between the devil and God that takes place before Job goes through that. As a matter of fact, all of the things that take place in Job's life is a result of God and the devil talking back and forth and God looking for a response out of Job. Look in Job chapter number 2. This is after his kids are already gone, his wealth and, and finances are already destroyed. Notice whenever the Lord talks to Job here, in ver or talks to the devil in verse number 3. The Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth? A perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. And still he holdeth fast his integrity, although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. And Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life. But put forth thine hand now, and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand, but save his life. Verse 7, So went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord, and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown. And he took, a pot, took him a potsherd to scrape himself with all, and he sat down among the ashes. The devil's the one who smites Job with these boils, this pestilence, this disease in his body. Now in Hebrews chapter 2 verse number 14, the Bible gives us the definitive statement on this and says that Satan has the power of death. He says the children are partakers of flesh and blood. He likewise took part of the same that through death, talking about Christ, he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. You remember the Passover night when the death angel came, the destroyer came, and then he saw the blood, then he would not take life. So we have to understand that Satan is in control of some of these things, and we realize some of this stuff is demonic and it is satanic. Jesus Christ attributes the infirmity that that woman had to the devil. Now let me pause here for a minute, and obviously we have Job to bounce off of in just a second. The charismatic side of this will be C. All sickness is of the devil. And so anybody who's sick, we need to make them well. Therefore, God gave us the power of healing and the power of signs. And by the way, if you go to these Assembly of God churches or you go to their websites and so forth, how come they're counseling church? How come they don't just have healing services and all the other charismatic groups and have all the people with the coronavirus? How come they just don't heal all those people? I'll tell you why. They do not have the supernatural power by God to heal anybody. They don't. And so all this stuff is a sham. It's a bunch of charlatans making money off people and twisting Bible verses 
for their own gain and own profit. Some of them are genuinely deceived and genuinely confused, and I'm not saying all those people are not saved. I'm not telling you that at all, but I'm simply telling you this. They'll take one verse and they'll run with it. I'll give you another verse they, they run with. We'll look at this in just a second. Go to Exodus chapter number 15. We'll go ahead and look at it now. Exodus chapter number 15. Here's the verse they like to use, verse number 26. Exodus 15, 26. Let's just read the last part of the verse. Right after the colon, right after Egyptians. Look at it. This is what they all use. For I am the Lord that healeth thee. They'll couple this verse along with Psalm 91. Who healeth, or Psalm 103, who healeth all thy diseases. Well, that may be Psalm 91, I think it is. There's another passage in Psalm 103 that mentions something very similar. So they'll take some of these verses and they'll push them together and maybe use the passage in Luke about Satan binding and there's a spirit on her. So obviously the devil has done this and God has come to destroy the works of the devil. So therefore it's God's will for everybody to be healed of all sickness and disease. Okay, what are you going to do with the Apostle Paul even during the apostolic time? Paul had a thorn in his flesh that God would not heal him of. And he said, my grace is sufficient for thee. You can't be ignorant of the scriptures all of your life. It's about time that we encompass what the Bible says and rightly divide the word of truth and come with a believing heart and a believing mind and say, okay, Lord, what do you tell me about this? Who's behind this? You say the devil, yes. You say God, yes. How do you say that? Job, what did he tell him? What, in Job chapter 2, what did we read? God told the devil, you go smite him. But in the previous passage, he said, you move me to destroy him. God is doing these things through the devil. So oftentimes, God will use the devil in his wickedness and in his ways to accomplish God's will. He mentions the Assyrian in the scriptures as being God's hand and being God's rod. The wicked is mentioned as being God's hand. And God will do those kind of things. So who's the author of this? Well, we can say the devil's the author of it, but we can also say God is the author of it. Isaiah 45, 7, a verse that has perplexed people from a lot of years. If they don't take the Bible in the right perspective, you just pull the verse out and run with it. You could be confused. Isaiah 45, 7 says this, God speaking. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. So God makes evil. And immediately your mind goes to evil as far as the opposite of good. But the scripture uses evil in the form of judgment as well. Doing evil to someone's house. In other words, judging them. God does judge his people. People say, well, I just don't understand that God would judge people, and I don't understand that God would have a hell, and God would pe put people into hell. Well, let me ask you this. Do you believe people should be punished that do wrong? Wrongdoers in our society, should they be punished? As soon as you, you say yes, you've already tied the rag on the bush and now you're already condemning yourself because God is just and God is righteous. And the reason we have justice in our own society is because it stems from the moral lawgiver that God is. God will punish sin. We are living in a cursed world where people get sick and people die. That is the fact of the matter. And you can have whatever religious belief you have, somebody can sneeze on you with a certain bug or a certain virus, and you can catch it. You say, what happens if you don't catch it? You praise God that you didn't catch it. So does that mean God prevented that? Absolutely yes. But you have to be able to back up and look at things in a big box instead of a small box because if you're not careful, then every time you see someone that does have something, you're going to be pointing the judgment stick instead of the corona stick, get away from me. You're pointing the judgment stick that you are unrighteous and you are wicked because something bad has happened in your life. And that's not always the case because the disciples all suffered hardship. They all suffered trouble and they suffered tribulation.
What are you going to do with the great tribulation period when the Jews go through that period and the believers that are in that time go through that and suffer for Christ? They still suffer and many of them die and are martyred. That doesn't mean that God does not love them. You want to find out if God loves them or not? Go to Calvary's cross and see God's love demonstrated when Jesus Christ himself suffers just like all of his creation. God couldn't die, but Jesus Christ did die. The problem of suffering is really what's behind this whole confusion. The problem of human suffering in the view of a loving God whom all of us know deep down that God is love. The Bible tells us that and we know that God is a good God, not a bad God, not an evil God. God is good and so that conflict, why the suffering of the world, especially when you begin to see it creeping in on you and you begin to realize this might happen to me, so then you run to this mysterious book that people oftentimes have made reference to as being prophetic and having the answers and you remember people saying that God has done things for them in their own experience and so you begin to run out of fear. That's a good thing if you will be honest with yourself when you face the truth of God and realize we are in a cursed world because of sin. And when God pronounced the judgment of this world in Genesis, he said, Curse, Cursed be the ground for thy sake. We've had sickness, we've had disease all through Bible times. And I'll give you some of these. You're in Exodus 15. Let's look at it. Verse number 26. This is God speaking. And said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and wilt do that which is right in his sight, and wilt give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians. For I am the Lord that healeth thee. He's bringing Israel out of Egypt. This is when the tribes of Israel become a corporate nation, an entity as a nation. And when he brings them out, he says, Look, if you will do what you're supposed to do, I will keep these diseases off of you. And by the way, I put the diseases on Egypt. It's God's judgment. Look over in the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 28, this is what we oftentimes refer to as the Palestinian covenant, which has to do with the blessings and cursings pronounced upon the people in relationship to their obedience as they go into the promised land. Deuteronomy chapter number 28, come down to... Um, Verse number 30, 35. Well, if you back up to verse number 15, this is when he starts the cursings. But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe, to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I commanded thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Cursed shalt thou be in the city. Cursed shalt thou be in the field. 16, 17, 18. All the way down. The heaven over thee shall be brass. Verse number 23. In other words, you won't get any rain. Verse number 24. Be smitten. Verse number 25. Before thine enemies. All these things will happen. Come all the way down to 35. The Lord shall smite thee in the knees and in the legs with a sore botch that cannot be healed from the sole of thy foot unto the top of thy head. Here's pestilences, diseases. Look down in verse number 59. Then the Lord will make thy plagues wonderful, and the plagues of thy seed even great plagues, and of long continuance, and sore sicknesses, and of long continuance. Moreover, he will bring upon thee all the diseases of Egypt which thou wast afraid of, and they shall cleave unto thee. Also every sickness and every plague which is not written in the book of this law, them will the Lord bring upon thee until thou be destroyed. And ye shall be left few in number, whereas you were as the stars of heaven for multitude, because thou wouldest not obey the voice of the Lord thy God. Judgment. Now we don't like to talk that way. We don't like to think that way. The problem is we can't back out of our proverbial box and we can't see the big picture. Here's the big picture. And we've been preaching this for years, but now all of a sudden we don't want to talk that way or even think that way. America and this world is a godless place. We have said no to God. We have spit in God's face. We have 
committed abominations in the sight of God, and we are being, quote-unquote, plagued, if you will. And if you really want to look at it, you just look at the death rate. What do you mean, preacher? I mean the death rate, period. 100%. So how does, what does God think about, about sin? Uh, look at the funerals and the uh, graves and the hospitals. You are going to die because the wages of sin is death. Does the Bible uh, prophesy about the COVID-19 virus? Yeah, if you want to be general about it. The wages of sin is death. It is appointed unto man once to die. Plagues have happened all throughout the history of mankind. Why should we be any different? Because we're Americans, because we have iPhones now, because we're smart and because we can do all these things digitally and we can work from home and we can build rockets to go up here and we can take a one-way trip to Mars. I mean, really, we are just as wicked, if not more so, than the Israelites when they came into the Promised Land. Years and years ago, Billy Graham made the statement if God lets America go unpunished, he will have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. That's a very true statement. We are getting just what we deserve. You say, well, I know some Christians that get sick too and the Christians die too. Yeah, judgment must begin at the house of God. Sometimes when tornadoes come through, you always hear the stories about the church that it misses, you know, or the, the church that it, it blows the church away and then it leaves the Bible intact. They don't tell you about the 15 other churches that it completely demolished or the other Christians who died. See, when you begin to play these games and look, you want to be real careful. I'm not saying don't stand up and testify and say, you know what, God healed me of my sickness that I have. Or I'm not telling you not to stand up and testify. You know what, I was almost in an accident and I missed the accident and I came up on it later if I would have left a little bit earlier God spared me for the accident but be real careful because what you're saying is God spared you but he didn't spare somebody else so we want to make sure we understand this it's kind of like saying I'm okay and you're not okay so God blessed me and he didn't bless you it falls back into the cares maniac dementia attitude of our Pentecostal friends in other words everything that's bad is of the devil and everything that's good is of God and if you're walking with God and you're talking with God and you're doing right you'll be blessed healthy wealthy and wise that is just not the case sometimes trouble oftentimes Trouble and tribulation happen to good people because all things work together for good to them that love God, to them where they're called according to His purpose. He will use bad things for good purposes. And you've got to see that. You've got to get that. There are two sides to the coin. But I think we're so caught up in our own reason. We're so caught up in the way we see it. We're so caught up in our own ignorance of history. We're so caught up in our own ignorance of the scriptures that all we can see is the way we see it. And we can't back up and see it any other way. In Job 34, verse number 29, he mentions withholding himself. He mentions God withholding his presence, hiding him face, his face, he says, whether it be done against a nation or against a man only, God can withdraw. And if God pulls his blessings off of your life, you're going to experience problems. If God pulls his protection off of your life, look, it's right and it's just to make these types of statements. You know, every good gift comes from above, from the Father of lights. I'm able to inhale and exhale because God gave me the ability. I woke up this morning because God gave me the ability and the strength to get up. I can lift up my leg and put it down because of God. I can take a, a taste of food because of God. I can eat. I can sleep. I can breathe. I can walk. I can talk. I can hear. I can see because of God. But we don't want to say that whenever those things are taken away. We want to oftentimes blame the devil or someone else, or we want to become bitter to God. So you want to make sure you understand the play right behind this. Now let's talk about our perspective and I'll be done and I'll basically pick the context back up where we were in Matthew chapter 24, dealing with the Olivet Discourse where Jesus Christ mentions His second coming. And I made reference in our preface remarks about the second coming and about the prophecies in the Bible about the second advent. When I make references about the second coming, you must realize, if you rightly divide the word of truth correctly, that when we refer to Jesus Christ coming back, there are two aspects of this coming. And it's very clear in Scripture. There's an aspect of His coming, much like 
you see a division of his first coming where Bible prophecy said that he was going to be born as a baby in a manger and he was going to be born in Bethlehem. We know that's true and we know that refers to his first coming. But it also mentioned him dying on the cross, which was his first coming as well. That thing separated by 33 years. But it's made reference to as the first coming. So the second coming of Christ has two phases to it as well in Bible prophecy. The first phase has to do with him coming for his church, and that is all believers, all saved believers in this age will be raptured or taken up into heaven at the Lord's coming. We call that the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But the second phase of his coming is called the revelation of Jesus Christ. And those are to be distinguished. And you must make that understanding because when you read Matthew chapter 24, the whole context of that passage is the end of the world. The whole context of that passage deals with the beginning of sorrows and the great tribulation period and the second advent of Christ, his revelation on the ground, not his rapture of the church up in the clouds. I'll give you some of these distinctions. You must understand and we'll turn over to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4. We'll read these. Many of you are familiar with this, so we won't belabor the point. So we can finish up the message here. But the rapture of the church is Jesus Christ coming for the church. In the Revelation, the Bible says in Revelation 19, that the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean. So the revelation is Jesus Christ coming back with the church. Jesus Christ appears in the clouds at the rapture. Jesus Christ lands on the earth in the revelation. The rapture is said to be a mystery, and it's said to be a secret thing. In other words, he says, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all, all sleep. We shall be changed in a moment the twinkling of an eye. The resurrection... And the revelation of Christ is to the whole world. You read about that in Revelation chapter 1. He says, every eye shall see him and they also which pierced him. It's a revelation where he reveals himself to the entire world. He takes the Antichrist. Revelation chapter 19 verses uh, uh, 10, 11, somewhere in there. He takes them and he puts them, the Antichrist, toward the end of the chapter. He puts them into the lake of fire. He destroys that, sets up his kingdom. The whole world sees him. The rapture is the gathering of his church. The revelation is the establishment of his kingdom. Jesus Christ comes as a bridegroom of the church in the rapture. In the revelation, he comes as the king of the Jews and the king of all the world. Revelation chapter 11, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. The rapture of the church is before the great tribulation period that you read about in Matthew chapter 24. The revelation comes at the end of that great tribulation period. The rapture of the church starts or, cons or consummates the church age. The revelation of Jesus Christ consummates the kingdom age, the millennium. Look in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. But I will not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Verse 15, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. We're not looking for signs. We're listening for a sound. We are looking for Jesus Christ to come back. Look at chapter number 5 of the same passage. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5, come down to verse number 9. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. In Revelation chapter number 6, you read about the wrath of the Lamb. Revelation 6, 16. These are people in the tribulation crying out, and they said to the mountains, the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able 
to stand. Come back to Matthew chapter 24 real quick. I want you to understand, when you read Matthew 24, you're reading prophecy relating to the Son of Man. And when you study Paul's epistles and he presents Jesus Christ as the bridegroom to the church, Paul always references Jesus Christ as the Son of God, not because they're two different people, but they're two different aspects of Jesus Christ's roles. Jesus Christ to us is the Son of God because we are a heavenly people. We look for a heavenly city, New Jerusalem. Jesus Christ as the Son of Man is a king to an earthly people, the king of the Jews. So therefore, Matthew 24, when you make reference here to the Son of Man, you see it real clear all throughout the passage. Come down to verse number 8, Matthew 24, 8. These are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. And ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. There is worldwide persecution, verse number 9. You read about this in the book of Revelation. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. You say, well, preacher, haven't we seen some of these things? Yes, in moderation you have. You've seen earthquakes. You've seen famines. We've seen pestilences. So I know we can use the analogy and say, okay, here you are. You're driving up to, to Chattanooga, Tennessee. And as you're driving up uh, to Chattanooga, Tennessee, uh, your destination actually, uh, let me switch this around. Your destination is Atlanta, Georgia. And you're driving up to Atlanta, Georgia, and you see signs to Chattanooga, Tennessee, because if you stay on I-75, eventually you're going to go through Atlanta and you're going to get to Chattanooga. So we may see some end time signs. I'm not denying that. I will not deny that as the scripture says in the book of Daniel, knowledge shall be increased. When you look at the exponential rate of knowledge, especially in the last 50 years, it's off the charts. And when you begin to study people running to and fro and world globalization and the unity of nations and religions as far as commerce are concerned and as far as religion is concerned, it matches a lot of the things as far as signs that I believe lead up to the great tribulation period that you read about in the book of Revelation. However, you can't lose your head with all of this. In Paul's epistles, we are always told to look for Jesus Christ. We're never told to look for the Antichrist. We're never told to look for the temple to be rebuilt and restored in Jerusalem. We're not told to look for the mark of the beast on our hands or some computer chip. We're not told to look out for some plague or some pestilence that's going to happen. We're not told to look for some sacrifices that are going to be done in Jerusalem. We're not told to look for any of those things. We are told, exhorted, encouraged to look for the blessed hope, the Lord Jesus Christ, Titus 2.13. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 7. He says, so that you come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians chapter 3. Our conversation is in heaven. For whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. We are looking for him. We're not looking for the Antichrist or some sign in this world or some pestilence or some plague. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, when he encourages the Thessalonians about their testimony, he says that you wait for his son for, from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. That's what they were doing. They were waiting for Jesus. They weren't looking for all these things. Oh, so we're getting close. Let's see if Matthew 24 is being fulfilled. Look at it. You're Matthew 24 still, right? Look at it. I'm about to wind it down. Every time I wind it down, it seems like the Lord winds it up. I am landing the plane, I promise you. Matthew 24. Look at it. Verse 11, we can concede that some of this is obviously true, especially if you watch Jim Baker sell his tribulation food or his coronavirus cure or whatever, or Kenneth Copeland uh, pronouncing the end of the coronavirus in a prophecy that he makes. What an idiot. Look down in verse 11. Many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, verse 12, the love of many shall wax cold. Verse 13, pay attention. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. Then shall the end come. When ye shall therefore see the abomination of desolation, desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth let him understand, then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. 
The beginning of sorrows in verse number 8 ties into verse number 13. These things that begin to trigger the great tribulation. You have the gospel of the kingdom of heaven being preached, which is the same thing Jesus and his disciples were preaching. That had to do with accompanying signs, wonders, and miracles, because Jesus as the king was going to take over the world and set up his government. It has nothing to do with the gospel of the grace of God that Jesus Christ dies as the atonement, as the substitutionary perfect atonement, the Lamb of God, for people to believe and be saved from hell. That is completely foreign to the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. And so you want to make sure you understand that. How do you know? Because verse 13 has to do with enduring to the end and that matches all of the prophetic passages we have in the book of Hebrews and in the book of Revelation that refer to people in the tribulation that must have the faith of God and keep the commandments of Jesus Christ because if they don't they will succumb to the temptation to take the mark of the beast. And when they do, they are not saved. They lost their salvation and they go to hell. You cannot lose your salvation and go to hell. Therefore, the COVID-19 pandemic is not a prophecy that is in the tribulation prophecies. This is a plague. This is some type of virus, just like there have been many other viruses that we've had to deal with. It is a trouble. It is a tribulation. And now here's your perspective. Biblically, you are to keep your eyes on Jesus Christ, not get tied up and tangled up in what somebody says the Bible says about it. You need to rightly divide the Bible and understand as a Christian, you're looking for your bridegroom, the Lord Jesus Christ, to get you out of here. We're not going through the great tribulation. You might run out of food. You might starve. I don't know. That doesn't mean you're in the great tribulation period. The Antichrist is not on the scene. The mark of the beast is not being given out. And if it is, we've already missed the rapture and you're doomed anyway. If you're saved, you're going up in the rapture. You have eternal salvation, eternal security. You can't go through the great tribulation period. Now Paul said this, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. Your perspective should be one of looking for Jesus. Is it a sign of the time? For us, for us, if it draws you closer to Jesus, hooray. That's great. I'm glad our world has shook up a little bit if it drives you closer to Jesus. Preachers have been trying to get people to quit going to sporting events on Sunday for years and years and years. They've been trying to get people out of the bars for a long time. They finally got it. We didn't know it was going to come this way because they're out of the churches too. Is it drawing you closer to Jesus Christ? Why don't you let God do something in your life with this? If you're not saved and you're listening to this, you need to get saved because there's something a whole lot worse than COVID-19 that's going to overtake you. It's called death and it's called hell. And if you die and go to hell, the scripture tells you the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. You need to trust Jesus Christ before it's too late. G. Campbell Morgan, the great preacher from Westminster Chapel of years and years ago, said this, To me, the second coming is the perpetual light and the path which makes the present bearable. It makes the present bearable. He's coming back. And so you need to get your perspective right. So how do we respond to this? In the book of Amos, he talks about judgment coming. He said that I smote them, slain them with the sword, and taken away your horses. I made the stink of your camps to come up into your nostrils. Yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. Amos 4, verse number 10. As a judgment, as a trouble, as a trial, how should we respond? We should be crying out for God's mercy, for God's help. And we as believers, when our world has gotten shooken up a little bit, it should draw us to be looking for His appearing. Maybe he is using this to set up some, some commerce and set up some economy and, and, and bring some downfalls of some nations. I don't know how he's going to use all this. I just know the Lord's got this under control. But don't fall prey to the false prophets that try to read the newspaper into the Bible. Or better yet, they try to read the Bible by interpreting it in the light of the news events of the day. You need to rightly divide the word of truth and keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for the scripture. Thank you, Lord, for 
the sanity and the sound mind that you give us if we stay in the Bible. I pray for my brothers and sisters in Christ that they would get in the Bible and let the Bible get into them and they would understand they need to rightly divide the Bible before they get all confused in misapplying Scripture that has to do with the nation of Israel, the Jews, and the future tribulation period. Lord, help us as Christians to keep our eyes on Jesus, to have the right attitude as we go through this, to be a good witness and a good testimony to those that we're able to influence during this time. And for anyone that may be listening that's not saved, I pray that they'd ask Jesus Christ to be their Lord and Savior before it's too late. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.